The first two case studies come to rest. Now is the time where the first panel of discussion starts. The concept of this panel discussion is strategic alliances for greater impact. Now, this particular panel discussion encourages collaboration between different organiza organizations like governments, businesses, and charities to tackle social issues. These alliances combine the strengths and resources of each member, leading to a more significant positive impact than individual efforts. This teamwork benefits young people by providing opportunities for skill development entrepreneurship and leadership roles. The panel discussion will explore how to improve this collaboration for maximum effectiveness. I'd like to call upon the panelists on the stage now. Her Excellency Daniel Muley, Ambassador to Embassy of Switzerland in Nepal. <clears throat> Dr. Marco Gemmer, Head of Cooperation, Delegation of the European Union in Nepal. Mr. Arbind Kumar Sinha, State Project Manager, PIA, Coordination and Development, Bihar Ruler Livelihoods Promotion Society, Star Ruler Livelihoods Mission, Bihar, Jivika, Bihar Government, India. <clears throat> Ms. Seema Golcha, Director, Golcha Group. Now, I'd like to call upon the moderator, Mr. Asis Thakur, Chairman and Executive Director, Global Private Limited. The mics are placed. Asis has the mic. Asis, on to you. Thank you, Jay. Distinguished panelists, thanks for being here. Namaste. Uh, all the young people here in the room, very nice to see the enthusiasm and you being here on time. We're starting the program on time. And we're starting the panel as well. Two minutes delayed, but still we'll cover that two minutes and end this panel at 2 p.m. itself to move on to next two presentations that you will get into. Before I start this panel, I'd like, like to tell a small story that happened on Saturday. You might have seen the presentation just here by a team of three people. They came up to me and said, we might not, uh, uh, we would like to be at CEU Unplugged. I said, have you registered? They said, no, we are the participants of case study presentation. I said, then wait for the result and if you are in the top four, you will be at CEU Unplugged. They said, we are in class 11. All of the others are bachelor students. So we might not be there. I said, just wait and let's see. And then if you are not there, then come and talk to me. And they are here. So claps for them. <laughs> this shows is class, just the subjects that you study does not really matter. What matters is how you can perceive, how is your intention and how is your willingness. And that is, again, sold by you all three people. Congratulations to you for being here on this panel. I remember my college days where I was on the same A-level student and competing with bachelor students. And we also won. And you, are, you guys were here today. So great congratulations to you all. Moving on to the panel. Thank you, panelists, for being here. I would like to, this, this panel is all about strategic alliance and global world. So I'd like to start with a very small thing to initiate this whole thing. If you could say hello in your own native languages, anything that you speak, we just want to show how globalized this panel is. Excellency. Bonjour. Bonjour. I think that's French. Guten Tag. That's German. Pranam. That's Hindi. Namaste. That's Nepali. Namaste. We live in a very, very globalized world today and where we have been working relentlessly from all our spheres to work and show the world that impacts can be created 
together. And this panel is all about those impacts which, are, which can be created with the strategic alliance, which is about coming together for the synergy. One plus one is not just two, it's 11. And this particular program where we are here today, which is going for last nine years, and the skill week itself is going for last five years, is all dependent on the strategic alliances between all the collaborators that we have. So that's the importance. This is just an example. There have been amazing works being done by different collaborators for the government of Nepal, for the youths of Nepal. And we'll just be discussing that with this panel. We'll just have a conversation and we'll come back to you as well for questions and, and, and answers. And please make sure that the question and answer when you ask is related to the subject that we are discussing here today. Thank you so much. Let me start with Her Excellency. My first question to you, Her Excellency. Switzerland has a strong reputation for vocational trainings. How is Switzerland collaborating with Nepal to develop strategic alliances that enhance skill development programs for Nepali youth, making them more employable in the global market? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me uh, on this panel. Um, Switzerland has indeed a long tradition of dual education, meaning education that takes place both in a school and in a business or in a company. About 70% of Swiss youth enroll for this kind of education, which is currently referred to as the dual vet apprenticeship. Now, it is important to understand why this kind of education is so popular among young Swiss. It is not because 70% of them are not able to get a university degree. It is because they know that the education they will get as vet education is of high quality and that it will equip them with the skills that are needed to find a good job. Because indeed, it has vet education as a strong track record in providing jobs, and the unemployment rate among VET graduates is very low. And there are also inspiring success stories. The CEO of UBS, this is the biggest bank in Switzerland, and it ranks among the top 20 banks in the world. So the CEO of UBS started as an apprentice in a bank. So based on our experience and learning, we have been supporting the government of Nepal since over a decade in introducing the VET system in Nepal, but for sure, customized to the needs of Nepal. So this is a complex endeavor, and the key strategic alliance that is needed is the one between schools and industry. So for businesses to participate into the system, they have to understand that this is beneficial for them in the short and in the long term. And we increasingly see that private sector understands these benefits. Since 2018, there has been 750 enterprises all over Nepal offering 4,000 apprenticeships. And last year, the private sector has invested about 90, 90 million rupees in improving the system. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's very much fulfilling to listen about those examples as well. Let me move to Ms. Golcha and let's talk about some uh, private sector activities. So Ms. Golcha, the private sector plays a very vital role in in the youth development, and we have seen your organization also being part of such uh, youth development activities. How can these strategic alliances between businesses and NGOs or the government create impactful opportunities for young people, particularly in skill building and entrepreneurship? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I feel 10 years younger, or maybe 15, sitting in with all of you here. So Great. thank you for bringing me here. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's a very important the private sector alliance with development agencies because uh, uh, both the parties need each other. And that's how together we can bring the skill development. Um, the industries have the specific um, needs and which can be fulfilled. They're looking for some skilled workers that can be fulfilled by development agencies because uh, private sector can provide financial support but the rest of the support to find the right guy, the skilled person, then you need the help of development agencies. Today, in Nepal scenario, we all know that more than 2,000 youth, 2,000 plus, is leaving Nepal every single day. Unfortunately, 90% are going for unskilled work. I had it been a skilled, uh, there would be more dignity of labor, it will be better earning. But having said that, this is the current situation. So what you are talking is all the more relevant in Nepal at present scenario. Private sector can provide internship. Private sector can provide mentorship because we have the experience. What the youth comes out from college is whatever they have learned in books. But to be able to see the reality, how it works, there can be all these internship programs. Um, like um, to give you an example, like Microsoft had tied up with the Youth Build and the US NGO where they give digital training to the youth. NCEL has tied up with the UN where they have given digital literacy programs. I have worked with Zonta Women Empowerment where uh, we have worked with NCEL and we have given digital literacy programs in most in many of the villages. So this kind of alliance can work uh, for the benefit of both the sectors. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we talked about private sector. We talked about how uh, it's been done in Switzerland. Let's come to Dr. Gemma. From your perspective, Dr. Gemma, at the EU, how are strategic alliances between government institutions and international organizations crucial in empowering youths in Nepal? We see, and also congratulations to European Union and us to Nepalese as well for the 50th uh, year anniversary celebration. So how has this 50 years been working, Dr. Gemma? Thanks, Asish. The, this is a long question for an old man. Um, I try to remember. We just talk about youth here. So yeah. you, are, you are a young person. Yeah. Let's start with the definition of youth. Um, in Europe, our definition of youth is uh, up to 35. When I came to Nepal four years ago, I learned that I could very well be a youth political leader in the Nepali system. Even if you're 60, you just declare, I'm a youth leader, it works. Uh, so this is, I think, where in Europe we are a bit structured uh, by, for instance, declaring 2022 as the European Year of the Youth. And we have rolled this out in our engagement with Nepal. Um, we have called in for a youth sounding board that is helping us to make decisions, to make it better, to involve them in our strategic decisions. Because very often we have invited young people but this is a one-off. You have a workshop, there's young people, and then of course we do the greenwashing, and then, oh, there's no gender balance, let's put a woman on the stage. A lot of wrong things have happened in the last 20 years, I must say, especially on youth engagement. And I think the lesson learned is that if we want to listen to young people, we need to go beyond inviting them for meetings. We need to have them in the strategic decision-making. There needs to be a platform for consultations. So we have a lot of young people here, but how do we make sure that you go to your communities and you feedback and have a, a mechanism for you to feedback what your friends and colleagues and classmates are discussing? And I think in the 50 years of European Union engagement with Nepal, I think not everything was perfect in the first year or the second or the third year. This is why we have strategic partnerships. So the European Union and Nepal, we're growing stronger together. This is the slogan of our celebrations because we keep on growing. There is no end to growing. If you stop uh, learning, you start dying. There is a proverb. And this is where we have learned in, to enter into strategic partnerships. Uh, strategic partnership, for instance, with Glocal, because it's not enough to be at this event once uh, with the Global Teen Hero, which is coming later this year, I assume, we have a strategic partnership. We have a strategic partnership with the government at the federal level, with provinces, uh, with municipalities. 
you don't get it right the first year, but you have to listen and to be able to feedback uh, uh, into your actions what you hear on the ground. And this is a long-term process. So we are working, for instance, through grants at the local level, uh, with youth clubs, uh, with youth engagement, for young people to design the actions we are doing, together with the government at federal, provincial, municipal level. Because it's easy to say, let's do a workshop, you all come, we have very good food, you go home, and we hope you never get back to us. No, this is not how it works. The important thing is to put youth in the driver's seat of action. Not only to raise your voice, but to be on, in the driver's seat for the design of the activities. Because at the end, it all goes back to activities before we even can talk about outcomes. Because you need to design the activities in the way that is good for your timing. When are you free? Some of you go to school. We cannot decide when you have to be available. And this is, I think, the lesson learned that we have in our youth engagement in the European Union, which we also have rolled out here in Nepal, to put the youth in the driver's seat for you to design the activities at your speed. Sometimes we are very impatient huh? as, as development partners. We want quick results. We have to listen to young people. And if you say we need another year to develop something, we have given that time. And this was a very big learning process for us uh, in order to, let's call it, to have this strategic partnership uh, with youth that we are celebrating for instance, through Helvetas, which is a Swiss agency. Uh, and we know already, if after two years into such an activity, we don't ask ourselves, uh, do we have to change something? We do something wrong. Because when we start this partnership with young people, we don't know what is the end result. So we need to be able to adapt all the time to follow the young people's voice, the needs, the, sometimes it's intuitions. And I think it was a very big learning exercise for us to be more open, because traditionally we are not that open, especially when money is involved. Though. Uh, so I think we, we took quite some risks here in Nepal, because Nepal has such a young uh, society. And if we don't manage to have young people in designing their future, we heard 2,000 young people leaving every day, how long do we want to wait to make Nepal livable uh, with employed youth? Sorry, that was much longer. That no, was a long question also. Huh? Yes, long question and, and a very nice answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, as you said, uh, the youth, youth needs to be at the driving seat. And, and that is what uh, we also see here. The whole thing that was going before this panel about national case study is in Nepal, we do not have case studies to be taught in business schools, especially of the Nepali businesses. And that has become a youth problem. And that, that is where we brought in young people from different colleges to participate in national case study competition and bring in case studies to, to the table. So let's move on to Mr. Sinha, who is all the way here from uh, Bihar. He is the part of Bihar government uh, of India, government of India, uh, for the skill development uh, in there. And he would also mention some things about it. But my question to you, Mr. Sinha, is your work involves collaboration across state governments. Can you elaborate on the challenges and benefits of such cross-border alliances uh, in addressing issues faced by young people in the region? You can say from the perspective of Bihar, but if possible, you have seen two days of Nepal from yesterday, if you can also somehow incorporate some bit of it. Thank you. Thank you, SSG, for putting in such an... Okay, let me first uh, tell about the organization which I am representing. Be I am coming from Bihar, one of the state of India, having much populated. And I am working as a state project manager, Bihar Ri Livelihood Promotion Society. Bihar Rural Livelihood Promotion Society, locally known as Jivika. Uh, you might be he heard about Jivika. Its uh, mission is to, um, to eradicate poverty from the community, from the basically rural community, 
and to strive forward to upgrade the status of the rural community, especially focus on women development. Okay, so Zivika's journey started in 2006. The government of Bihar has carved out a society which under the Society Act organization named Jivika and since 2006 it has completed approx 18 years of journey in Bihar. Uh, it's come under the Rural Development Department, Government of Bihar. Organization is headed by uh, Indian uh, Senior and Indian Administrative Service Officer who is designated as Chief Executive Officer of BRLPS. So our Jivika mission started in 2006 and now its major achievement is it's a more than 1 million of SAG groups and it's covering more than 1 crore of household, especially women household. And our all interventions spin around our SAGs and their households. So you can imagine that more than 10 lakhs of self-help group and self-help group gets culminated into VO, village organization, which is more than 70,000. And then SAG, uh, VO culminated into CLF, com community, uh, uh, CLF is a community level federation. Okay, it's uh, more than 12,000. Uh, yes, it's more than 12,000. So our all activities directly goes from state up to the villages through our offices at district level and at the block level. Okay, so the thematic experts are at state level as well as at block level. Now coming to the question. So how we are moving ahead with the government? Being a Jivika is a government organization and our major focus in relation to the youth is on the skill development and throughout the one of the biggest program of uh, government uh, central government flagship program under skill development is Deen Dayal Upadhyay Gram Kaushal Yojana DDUGKY in short and government of Bihar is also running a similar mission through Bihar State Development Mission BSDM it is locally known as and the target of the BSDM and Jivika is very much similar but the target stakeholders are different here our target stakeholders are basically rural below poverty household and the bsdm target stakeholders are rural and urban both mix so our main focus is on the family who are below poverty line and from the rural sects so the our partnership and alliances with the private institution and with the local institution, I would like to enumerate before the house that we have more than 95 private partners for execution of Deen Dayal Upadhyay Gram Kaushal Yojana, having the target of 1,18,000 and we have almost achieved uh, uh, 90,000, more than 90,000 youths in last four years as a trend. And we have placed more than 50% of the youth in India. And our uh, third party assessment is compulsory in this ongoing scheme. So sector skill council under the government of India is the third party assessment bodies where we secured almost 84 percent of the youths are assessed, uh, assessed ne, almost uh, more than 84 percent are assessed and more than 70 percent are certified because certification also is a mandatory so this right, so ju just to just to point it out yeah. uh, the actual thing that we also want to hear from you yes. uh, mr shinna is what kind of alliances uh, does Jivika have in the stakeholder? Uh, one is Bihar government, of course, but then uh, what are the other strategic yes, yes. alliances that, that Jivika has? Yes, yes. Our strategic alliances with the World Bank, 
ओके आवर स्ट्रेटेजिक अलायसेस विथ द कम्युनिटी आवर मेन फोकस इज द कम्युनिटी तो वी हैव अ डीप अलायंस विथ कम्युनिटी दैट्स वाई द कम्युनिटी लेवल सोसाइट फेडरेशन वी हैव डेवलप्ड राइट फ्रॉम सेल्फ हेल्प ग्रुप to village organization and to the clf level so our main stake holder and alliances with the community and the local institutions which are being developed by us and which are also the part and parcel of the government of bihar great so from uh, if you uh, like to hear about the external so we have a partner like uh, pfi pci uh, even 3c even bmgf so these are the private sector partners bmgf bill gate melinda foundation is the international all right. are the these are the international right. agencies which are partnering with the jivika sure and thank you okay thank you so, mr sinha thanks uh, we have thanks. already touched the entrepreneurship part from uh, ms golcha uh, as well but moving on with the same your excellency uh, i would like to ask this question to you entrepreneurship can be a powerful driver of economic growth how can switzerland and nepal collaborate to create strategic alliance that fosters innovation and entrepreneurial spirit among young nepalese leading to job creation and economic development thank you for the <laughs> thank you for the question um The first thing I would like to say is that uh, the Nepali private sector uh, has shown remarkable resistance and resilience. It continues to expand and to grow despite years of uh, instability, multiple natural calamities and other disruptions. So I would say that there is a strong entrepreneurial spirit in Nepal. now things could certainly be better and switzerland through its various development projects has been supporting the different spheres of government in nepal to create an enabling environment for private sector development and for foreign direct investment because we strongly believe that the private sector must be at the forefront of job creation and a key issue for the creation of an enabling business environment is to improve some important things for the private sector especially for smes they need to have an improved access to growth capital they need to have better access to business development services and they also need to have access to better human uh, resources and on this last point uh, it is what i mentioned at the beginning that uh, we are working uh, with the government of nepal in introducing the the vet system in nepal but we have been doing uh, other things uh, supporting the nepali stakeholders in a variety of uh, of different ways and for instance to to strengthen the economic relationship between nepal and switzerland we have organized two fact finding missions for swiss companies so that we organized there they came to nepal to better understand the realities and the potential of the economic uh, situation in nepal and of its market I could give many other examples but um let me just add that uh, together with the World Bank we have also supported uh, the provincial investment climate assessment these pika have been done uh, for all provinces in Nepal and they will be followed by a work plan to implement the policy changes that have been recommended uh, in the assessment and a last point that i would like to stress is that to foster the entrepreneurial spirit innovation and to uh, create an enabling environment it is important to have initiatives from local governments at the grassroots level but it is important that there is also strategic guidance at the provincial and the federal level 
So it's very important as development partners that we support the ongoing devolution of role and responsibilities to uh, provinces and local governments, but it is also important that uh, we support uh, the collaboration between national and subnational authorities. Thank you, Sinti. We are halfway the panel, and uh, after this question, we will get about 10 minutes uh, of question answer. If you have any questions, uh, please be prepared, and I'll also ask the uh, technical team to support you with Mike, but after this question. And this question is to Ms. Golja. We just talk about the private sector is a very integral part in terms of job creation or in terms of entrepreneurship development now, and as such. Uh, with your experiences, what would you, you say? How important is it to have a clear goals and measurable outcomes at the beginning of any alliances that we move forward? And how do we ensure that that happens? Yeah, for any alliance, I guess the most important thing is the both the parties, they, the vision and the goals is very, very clear until and otherwise it just leads to bad relations in the end. So transparency, very important, what you're working on. And uh, also along with that flexibility, with the scenario changing scenario, sometimes the priority change, in, especially in context of Nepal, you have an alliance static with something and then band happens or a hartal happens and the border is closed. So we need that kind of flexibility and also evaluation. After any alliance, how did it work? Did it fulfill what we were supposed to do? So that in future, when you want to continue further, that evaluation is very important for further continuation of it. And... Um, as I said, from the both the party, it is important that we are clear in our vision. And uh, that's how when we, are, as a private sector, when my group does any kind of alliance, these are the points we look and uh, that's how we go ahead. Thank you. Any questions? Please. Mike, please. Just your name and the question related to this panel. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Sumit Kumar sir. My question is to Her Excellency. Uh, in terms of geographic and economic partners, Nepal and Switzerland is really similar. Uh, Switzerland being in the partner of economic union, uh, I mean European Union, and Nepal having uh, big neighbors like China and India. And we both share a landlocked system. So we have both similar shortcomings and similar potential uh, gains. So what as what are the lessons? that Nepal can learn from Switzerland in terms of its economic growth, in terms of its educational growth, in terms of its youth empowerment. So, yeah, if you could answer it. Thank you, Yam. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think you're definitely right that uh, we share many uh, commonalities, you know, and um, this also uh, makes um, what is so interesting to, uh, to be in Nepal. Um, I think we could speak uh, a long time, you know, saying uh, what are the, the, the lessons that can be shared and so forth and so on. But um, just to focus again uh, on, on the issue of, uh, of Tibet, uh, because I think it's the topic today, <laughs> I would like to, to, to restress two things uh, that I've uh, hinted at in my uh, previous answer. Uh, the, the first, I think, is that it's important to understand that uh, vocational training has a value in itself. And as I said, it's not because young people cannot go for a university degree that they choose to go for Tibet. And so there is uh, this uh, idea of doing it because it is worth doing it. Then the second point that I would like to, uh, to stress uh, in terms also of the strategic alliance with the private sector, it's that, well, having, offering an apprenticeship and uh, providing some in-house training, it already happens. But the TVET, it does not end there. It is a system. And for the system to work as the system, there is the need for a strategic alliance also 
not only the schools with the private sector, but the government and all the system with the private sector, which must be heard. What do I mean when I say the system must function as a system? If you take, for instance, uh, an enterprise that would offer an apprenticeship position for a young lady to become a mason, okay. But it is important that her training follows a nationally acknowledged curriculum and then that it's sanctioned by a nationally acknowledged degree. It is the only way that this young girl can find a job as a mason elsewhere. And it is also the only way for these specific enterprises, when in need of a mason, to be sure that the ones that it will find on the market are the ones with the required qualifications. So it's important that there is a character of a public good, you know, because otherwise it's just in-house training. So this is a very important uh, element. Well, I could continue, but <laughs> with the story. Yeah. Great. Any more questions? No questions. Wow. Great. So we are that clear. I think we are doing a good job, Dr. Kema. So let's move to my questions then. Uh, my question was in line what you uh, mentioned earlier, uh, but if you could also elaborate in it in terms of uh, how you might have been doing it elsewhere, or what should be your what would be your suggestions to uh, the other stakeholders about this question? The question is beyond simply being beneficiaries. How can strategic alliance ensure the meaningful participation of young people in decision-making process that affect their life? If there are, like you have shared a best practice of youth sounding board, but if there are a few other ways that could be implemented. First of all, I mean, it's important that um, let's say all development partners work together, especially on the field of TVET vocational training, because federal government is our main entry point in our political relations. So if we are not working together as partners in strategic alliances, it will be extremely difficult for the federal government to coordinate between all partners. But we cannot replace then the coordination between the federal and the provincial partners, uh, um, government. And this is where we are providing support, because whatever can be done here in Kathmandu is limited. So this strategic partnership we all as development partners have, we call it uh, for instance, the International Development Partners Group. There we have thematic uh, working uh, groups on different topics. We don't have one group yet on youth, for example. We have one on uh, gender empowerment, social inclusion. Uh, the way we have reached out to our partners in these strategic partnerships, be it on TVET vocational training, on basic education, is we offer our engagement at local level also to other partners because not all of the development partners can establish a youth sounding board. The youth sounding board is what we see as an example for all development partners to feedback to the development partners, to local governments, provincial government, and the federal government. Um, we have collected, uh, for instance, questions of young people. What would you like to see to be discussed in our political dialogue that we have once a year with the federal government? and we are reading out then the position of the young people. Whenever we have headquarters coming, senior level, first meeting they have is with young people. And whatever we write in the briefing for our leaders, they are testing our hypothesis with the young people. But, I mean, this is one example only, but going down to the beneficiary level in the activities, so whether it's on nutrition, on basic education, on environment, on energy, we are trying to design the activities by young people for the youth engagement and then also making sure that this is reported to all the other development partner projects but also to other municipalities. Madam Ambassador mentioned the crucial role of the provinces to roll out federalism. This is where we are also supporting to get these youth voices from the local level back to the province for the province to make strategic uh, decisions about the engagement in the different municipalities. 
So very often there's a tendency to report from the local to the federal level. But the province is what young people identify with. This is where you grow up and this is where you know maybe your parliamentarians. This is where we have directly elected representatives. And this is where we still see a lot of need uh, for more strategic partnerships of young people with the federal uh, assembly, uh, not with the federal, with the provincial assembly and with the representatives there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, while we are talking about examples of how getting to strategic alliance and making it better for our young people, uh, Ms. Golcha, if you could share us a few uh, ideas or, or examples of your, what your group has been involved into in terms of youth development, uh, in terms of uh, youth's overall youth development and if it has a link to skills. Okay. So, Golcha Group uh, has always believed in youth. Most of our work or uh, CSR or any alliance is always related to wherever youth is involved. Uh, every corporate house has their own philosophy. Some can be with environment or some with uh, women empowerment. For us, it's always on basic on youth. For many years, uh, we have been tied with Teach for Nepal because we feel that education is the discriminating factor. And it, start, it has to start from right from the beginning. So Teach for Nepal is one of our big work we've done. We have tied up with uh, Glocal, where um, it was amazing because I was quite uh, actively involved. You know, as a private organization, you can financially support, but there are people in the remote areas we are unable to reach. That's where Glocal went. They discovered youth, their talent, and brought it forward. There was this guy who was uh, wanted to work on robotics, and he has, was doing amazing. But then after a certain point, you need a financial support, you need the platform, and that's where when we tied up, and otherwise as a industrial group or a business group, we would not be able to go up to these remote places and to discover and to find out these talented kids. So we have done it with local. Uh, we are now coming out with a college, so coming to the, again about the youth, uh, we are very much involved with sports, uh, Pulsa Sports Award, Many of you sitting here would know we have been partnering with that. Again, it is with uh, youth. Uh, with Zonta, we have worked in adult literacy program. So most of our programs, whatever we are doing from our corporate house, is related to um, helping in whatever the youth programs. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And it has been a pleasure of working with, in fact, all of you here uh, on the dais and uh, uh, Always, this is strategic alliances uh, help and keep us supporting in terms of making the collaborations better uh, as as we move forward. Uh, coming back to Mr. Sinha, uh, we we got to know about Jivika. We got to know about what you have been doing. Has there been ever been a cross border uh, collaborations uh, or even interstate collaborations? Uh, for Jivika and uh, your your organization that you have been yeah. working for. Yeah, uh, no. I would like to inform this house and to your good self that Jivika is uh, since beginning is collaborating with the multinational agencies, private agencies, in order to diversify your intervention. One has to be very pluralistic in approach. Singular approach will never work. So, in our skill development, we have a tie, tie up with Australian Skill Development University in order to impart the training to our trainers because we have more than 200 of a skill development center in between 19 to 22. So, we have arranged a, a MOU with Australian Skill Development University so that the non-domain part like soft skill, computer literacy, English spoken, they will take care of the TOTs part of our trainer. So this is one of the example in our skill development ecosystem. Similarly, we have a, a uh, tie up with Odisha uh, is one of the state where the, uh, one of the universities, I'm name is forgetting that we have tie up with them for assessment of the 
ongoing training projects. So we are looking forward to have a, a tie up with a, a similar such institutions which are aligning with our objectives. I just forgot I would like to add on that Barwick University, we have tie up with them for a doing a research work on the impact of the ongoing skill development. So uh, we have re uh, last year received the report also. They have uh, appreciated our effort basically focused on the rural, uh, rural development and especially the skill development. How we have managed to ensure the continuity of the skill development program during COVID period since 20 to 22. Two years we have been affected by COVID, but we have reduced our batch capacity, center capacity to one fourth. And then that training get continued during that even the such a drastic situation. So these are the ways in which we are collaborating with the private partners, with the MNCs, with the out of state, even out of country. So these are the few examples. Great, great, thanks. That, that makes me come to a, a, a question which we were having, few of us, we were having a roundtable discussion yesterday and this is open for anybody, whoever wants to answer this, uh, please feel free. Uh, we were having our industry academia roundtable discussion yesterday in the same venue um, amidst the skill week where we were discussing about the curriculum, the uh, skill standards, and also about the skill tests. So skill tests is done after we have a standard. So standard is the objective where which, which is checked for the skill assessment. Curriculum is teaching manual. How do we teach? Here in Nepal, the system is we have, uh, and if you can bring in your perspective to this, because we need those sections also to put into that roundtable discussion. The system in Nepal is there is a curriculum and the affiliation. So government itself runs those curriculum as a training school, but also it is given to a private sector, private technical school to teach as an affiliation. And the affiliation is done on the basis of curriculum, not on the basis of skill standards. And that is how it becomes when the curriculum is made in 2015 per se, the mobile devices that we use are already absolute of 2015 as of today. So the curriculum really does not match, but the examination and the affiliation happens to be of 2020, uh, 2015, and that is what we need to teach even in 2024 in the classrooms, which is not very applicable. So in your experiences, and this is open to anybody if you would like to answer, uh, how is it happening maybe in India, maybe it in Germany, or, or what should we bring in uh, what should we suggest, what do we put forward in terms of how this link of skill standards be led for uh, teaching, like establishing training institute where the students can come and study because not every time government can go to all the districts, all the municipalities and keep teaching. There needs to be training partners. Excellency, okay. If you thanks <laughs> thank you uh, I have the impression to sound like a broken record because I will say again I mean it's all about having the private sector on board and uh, and having this private sector on board as an actor so that its voice can be heard all over the system so as I said, it's, uh, it's something we've been supporting the government of Nepal doing for uh, quite a couple of, uh, of years. I think the, the, the element that uh, complicated the situation is that when we started, it was before uh, the adoption of the federalist constitution. So then we had to change the approach. But this is an opportunity also, huh? uh, because as we said, I mean, there is this devolution of, uh, of responsibilities. But you have to have the, the, the framework in place with some legislative uh, acts. And then your system must be flexible enough 
In Switzerland, we have the, the sector skills um, committee, so I cannot remember how it is, uh, so which meet quite regularly and can then adapt the curricula and the standards and the assessment and so forth and so on. And while I have the mic, <laughs> I will take the opportunity to mention another very important element in the, um, in the system. And this is something that we've also been supporting the government of Nepal to do with the, uh, what is called the national uh, qualification uh, system, which uh, actually ensures that two things, uh, that there is the permeability of the system in the sense that well, you know, when you are 16, you might think that you want to be a mason. So you start your apprenticeship and then you graduate like that. But then later on, you think, oh, I might have preferred to be a civil engineer. So that the system allows you to recognize these skills. And then if you want so to continue and to start again uh, some studies. And this is something that functions very well in Switzerland, and that is also what makes the attractiveness of the whole thing. And actually now at the embassy, we have an intern, a Swiss a young lawyer, and she started also as an apprentice. So you see. And then the other thing is also about the prior, the, the recognition of the prior learning and of all the learning that uh, is acquired in the informal sector, which is very relevant for Nepal. So if a student drops out of school and starts working here and there, for instance, as a cook, so then it's important that the system also allows him or her to get these skills recognized. So yes, a lot of work to do, but I mean, this can be done, but again, the central actor there is the private sector. Great, thank you. Anybody would like to add? Uh, yes. Asis, uh, I would like to add. Uh, uh, what uh, the model which uh, India is, uh, is following or has established, uh, if Nepal would like to replica, then it will be good for the youths in Nepal. First of all, India has established a NSDA, National Skill Development Agency, highest body for policy making of implementation of skill development. Secondly, the body which comes under NSDA is NSDC, National Skill Development Corporation. It's a partnership of the private agencies, private industries. Their CEOs are the member of this body and they are entrusted with responsibility of running this NSDC with an objective that whatever the skill demands of the industry, they can regulate and frame such curriculum which get implemented through skill development and they can get such type of talent for their industry. This is the objective. This is the institution established by Government of India, NSDA, NSDC. And thereafter, each state, province which you are calling, has a skill development mission, state skill development mission which take care of the implementation of the guidelines, decision of the apex body. So, we have a skill development courses, short duration, three years, uh, three months, six months, nine months, and up to year and one and a half year. And we have a, which is get controlled through NSDC and sector skill council. While the diploma courses like ITIs, etc. are getting regulated through NCVT. National Council for Vocational Training. So, Government of India has bifurcated the areas and roles in order to more emphasis on the youth development, on their skill development, and to meet the requirement, labor requirement of the industry of country. So, this is the basic right. which is get implemented in India. So, in order to that, so every department earlier has its own skill development. Now it's get converted into a single department that is the Department of Skill and Ent Entrepreneurship of Government of India. Under DS, uh, uh, Department of Skill and Entrepreneurship right. uh, Enterprises, this or NSDA, NSDC all are coming and through this 
So the government has tried to converge all the resources under one umbrella, Great. and that le leads the facilities down to the Great. earth. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Sinha. Uh, we, are, we just have two minutes, and I've been informed that we have now two question askers here, but we'll restrict to one. Uh, if you are there, yes, please. And then this is the last question. Please keep it brief. Mike, please. Your name and question. Hello, everyone. I'm Ria Shrestha. So since we have been talking about youth skills and private internships and jobs, and we also talked about youth, youth flying over in sorts of financial freedom or more exposure. So my question to Madam Golcha and our moderator is, uh, what I have seen is there is problem of internship in Nepal or there is no provision for college placement or private placement, even if we are skilled. So what, even if we are higher, we are not paid enough to, en to sustain. So can we put some light on this? Great. Yeah, thank you. So um, I cannot talk about any other organizations, but in our organization, we do have a program of uh, internship. Of course, it has to be aligned with the kind of work we are doing. Uh, only then it will be beneficial for you and for us. So we have had interns. In fact, even currently right now, I know five interns working under me. Because, But then uh, I per uh, personally look after electronics business. So the interns are from that line, and that's a proper. There's a proper program, structured program. If it fi it fits your need or something, then uh, and like ours, there are other organizations who are looking for interns. Talking about uh, payment, there are two kind of internship: paid and non-paid one. Uh, depending on the qualification, what it is, then that's how it works. Uh, at least we have a very proper structured internship program for youth. Great. Thank you. If the, uh, the question was also to me, so just to uh, add on a line to her uh, statement. Internship is to learn and you need to find the places. There are places, there are places open for internship all across the country. Find it, get into that, learn for three months. It is for learning, it's not for earning. Learn, it will gradually make you earn. But first, the step needs to be about learning. If you keep that open-mindedness for your internship approaches and opportunity finding, I believe you will 100% get it. Thank you so much, the, the audiences. Thank you for the amazing panelists uh, for being here and bearing my questions. Thank you so much. I hope I did not ask too much. Uh, over to you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the ones who ask questions, pretty much straightforward. And Dr. Gemma, it's always a pleasure, uh, you know, listening to you answer. Pretty straightforward, right there. And uh, Ms. Golcha, it's always a pleasure to have you. And also our delegate from Bihar, thank you so much for making your time here. And Her Excellency, definitely we strive forward to make Nepal as one of the most touristic destinations and we are striving forward to that. And hopefully next time when you come here, we'll be having a discussion of a different sort. And definitely uh, during my graduation uh, under MBA, I've always been a management student and we always had to go through this uh, rigorous report writing in terms of pestle analysis, one, right? So political, economical, social, technical, and legal manner. So all in a nutshell, you got it today. Whatever you need to do, however you need to do, you'll probably need an alliance from the government, from the dignitaries, from uh, the entrepreneurs, and each and every sector of the society. Thank you so much, everyone. Now, I'd like uh, to seize this moment and have a photograph all together. And before that, I'd like to call upon Ms. Kajol Jha, Associate Director at Global Private Limited, to kindly provide our speakers with the token of love. And we believe in the power of education and its direct, direct impact on students' future. And as a token of love this year, in your honor, we've distributed a year's worth of essential stationary supplies to all the students at Adarbhut Bidyale, Champapur, Lahan, Siraha.
Now we'd like to seize this moment, as I said, with a photograph marking this wonderful panel discussion and the ideas shared.